I am back. You are flying high with me over the zone in Alameda, California. Kind of a sad and a happy day in the zone. Sad for a number of reasons. We lost two icons in the past 24 hours. Um, one of them is uh, a great sports writer, journalist, Nobel Prize winner, and one of the most um, influential writers when I was growing up. He wrote, um, he wrote, Can't Anybody Play This Game? And it was about the 1962 New York Mets, the title of which came from um, a quote by Casey Stengel when they were playing some bad baseball. And um, he was a terrific writer. He wrote a bunch of books on the mob, about New York life, about gambling in New York. And uh, we're going to miss him. The other one, of course, was the uh, immortal Chuck Berry, a king of rock and roll, grandfather of rock and roll. So it's been kind of sad for that reason. Happy I get to meet a, um, a new friend, new to the zone. He wrote a terrific book on for anybody who wants to get into baseball, jobs in baseball. And uh, his name is Bill Guyvet. I hope I'm pronouncing his name properly. And welcome to the zone, Mr. Guyvet. Well, thanks, Ralph. And you, you did pronounce it perfectly. I might add. Whoa. Um, one out of 3,000 ain't bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad it was you because we we haven't had the pleasure, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you. Tell me um, first where you're from and how it came to be that you wrote a book um, on baseball and baseball jobs. Well, I'm a Sacramento kid. So grew up in Sacramento and played baseball there at Sacramento City College and went down to UC Santa Barbara and played baseball down there and, and graduated and signed. I was drafted four times, but eventually signed after my senior year with the Angels and played there and had a – after they put a screw in my shoulder to hold it together and blew out my knee, I was done and – Went to start coaching in college, which I coached at Loyola Marymount in Long Beach State, the original dirt bags with Giambi and Steve Traxel and, and a lot of good players on those teams. And then the Yankees came and offered me a job. And I got to tell you, Ralph, I'm the only man that took a pay cut to go with the New York Yankees. I'm the only man alive. <laughs> Well, George is dead. That's probably the reason. If George were alive, he would have opened up the books to you. Well, he was, you know, he was alive at that. He was alive at that time when I when I did that. So that was oh that was okay. Back, that was back you know, years um, I did. I should have done my homework more. I lived in Sacramento for two different times in my life. I was a big baseball fan, big Jerry Weinstein fan, Sac City. And I also happen to be the tops representative um, in the minors and covered the Angels an awful lot um, in those years. What were the years you played in the Angel organization? I signed in 1985 and played until uh, after my knee injury in 88. So I was in double did A. You, did you know uh, my good friend in life, Howie Gersberg? The late I knew Howie Gersberg very well, and in fact, I named him in the book. Um, he was a very good friend of mine. He was our pitching coach at Salem, Oregon, when I was in uh, rookie ball. And, well, I uh, knew we you up there. I was the top rep with the five dollar checks, and if you can That's remember, right. that, if you could remember that, our paths crossed um, in those sense. A little bit about Howie. He was the um, Pitching coach for years at St. John's, he was involved in the game that Ron Darling and Franco pitched against each other. Famous college baseball game. Um, and um, he later became um, 
a minor league guru with the Angels. Uh, what did you say about him in your book, Bill? I just named him as one of the people that I would uh, talk to a lot about uh, pitching, um, among others, but uh, more so than just pitching to me. He he was just a mentor in, in not just professional baseball or baseball, but life. He, he had a good way life of Life itself, absolutely. Talking, he was a, yeah, talking to kids and helping us put things in perspective of, you know, of a career and whatever else, and, and how he was just a great man to, to sit and talk with, and I really enjoyed it. Right. Tom Kochman was your manager, if I'm not mistaken. Tom um, Kochman was my manager in the California League in Palm Springs, uh, but okay. Bruce Hines was our manager up there, and then the next year I played for Mr. Kochman at, uh, in the California League. I still have some emotional scars after playing a year for Koch. Is he, he, uh, he, Koch's he, character. He, um, he, uh, Koch was the poor man's Tony La Russa, if, if, or yeah. Tony La Russa was the poor man's Koch. Koch had a lot going for him. He was an intense guy, but you, I'm sure you learned a lot from him as well. I did very much. And, you know, the one thing he taught us how to compete, and that's the thing, that compete as a team and, and – um, that's something I'll always take from him. He, I'm just joking. He's still a good friend, and, and I talk to him on occasion. He's out in Florida now, still working. Well, and, uh, you know, the more I uh, think about yeah. it, I have a set of cards, of baseball cards of the Palm Springs Angels. And it wouldn't surprise me if your, if your card was in there. Um, uh, it was back in the days of Jim Edmonds and Salmon if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, yeah, we had on our bit. team was uh, Dante Bichette. Dante, and, right. Uh, or Ty Van Berkleo. He's now the hitting coach with the Indians. Uh, there's a number of us. Brian Price, manager of the Reds. Brian Price, I oh. signed him with his tops contract. Um, uh, yes, just um, great years. How'd you become an author after all that? You know, all the time, I spent uh, 21 years in the front office. After I went to the Yankees, the Expos called me. I went with them as a farm director and then to Tampa Bay as a special assistant to the GM when they were getting everything ready. I was there before we actually had a major league club. And then the Dodgers called, and I went to them as assistant GM for a couple of years and then Went to the Rockies as director of player personnel, eventually senior VP of Major League Operations. But So 21 years in the front office and a number of years scouting and playing as well. And the whole time, Ralph, I would be out working or at a ballpark or whatever, and you know, people would send in the emails or come talk to me and say, hey, how do I get into baseball? And I would get in the same conversations time after time, and I'd always say to myself, you know, one day I'm just going to write a book. That way people can just read it, and I won't be sitting here in the same conversation all the time. So uh, okay. when I left the Rockies, I had a little bit of time, and I said, you know, I'm going to write that book. I was over in Hawaii on vacation. I just thought to myself, now's the t- if I'm ever going to do it, now's the time. And I said, let's do it. And I started outlining the book, and uh, eventually, after a year and a half, uh, came out with this book. And that's no easy feat for a baseball guy. You know, baseball guys aren't the smartest guys on campus, Ralph. I mean, that's no No, mean. actually, they, they really are, because you have a lot of time to think, and baseball is a thinking man's game. So don't be modest. Um, yeah, well, when you go in, in the classroom, I'm talking about, now I've got to put pen to paper and then eventually put it on the computer and, and type I it all understand. out. And that's the that's work. I mean, those, skills work. Transcend, the, those skills yeah, transcend, though. Those skills transcend. I guess. But I'll tell you, you what, I'm amazed that, that people think that I'm a good writer and I can write and – uh, even the people that, that read a lot of books, it's, I mean, just to hear from them, I never knew that I was, uh, that, that I had some skill as, a, as an author and as a writer because the comments have been tremendous coming back my way. So, uh, been very humbling. 
Did you have anybody in uh, journalism classes when you were a kid in high school or anything um, that influenced you in your writing? I really didn't. I mean, um, I, I can't say that at all. I never had, you know, I was an uh, economics major, so I never really had uh, any training or any formal training in writing. Um, I've always heard that I'm a good storyteller. So in the book, I have, um, you know, a lot of stories or, or whatever about whether it's scouting or player development or, um, you know, just as an internship and especially my time with Tommy Lasorda. He makes writing the stories easy because I'm just remembering, a lot of them are, I'm just remembering my experiences and putting that down. And I've been fortunate that I could, you know, remember the little details of stories pretty well. So, uh, you know, Bill, I put those let me ask you, well. what, what don't we know as, uh, as fans, people on the outskirts of baseball that aren't on the inside, what don't we know about Tommy Lasorda that would surprise us? I think uh, how much he cared about. Now, I got to tell you, when I was with the Dodgers, Tommy and I were with each other probably 80% of the time. If he had a speaking engagement somewhere, he might go and not, not be with me. But most of the time, whether it be in the office or if I was going to a minor league team, if I was going to go to Albuquerque, Tommy wanted to go. And if I was going to watch a big league club in Philadelphia or whatever, if we were playing the Phillies, Tommy Tommy would go with me. So we were together all the time. And in fact, we're going to have dinner this week. Um, I think the big thing about Tommy that people would never know is when we would go out to a restaurant, and he knew every Italian restaurant owner in the National League, probably the American League as well, every city across the country. But we would go out to these restaurants, and and we would go there, and he would talk to everybody, and it was sure it was great for the restaurant owner. But he would go back in the kitchen and talk to all the, the, the cooks and the chefs or whoever was preparing the food and tell them how great they were and all that. No, no Nobody could see that. Nobody could see how he would go back and talk to the people that don't get much fanfare. And I always appreciated that with him. Wherever we went, nice. uh, you know, wherever we went together, he'd always try to find out the people that, that seemed like weren't getting any recognition, and he would give them recognition. And that, to me, is – I'll always hold that dear in my heart of the time I spent with Tommy. Well, when I think of Tommy Lasorda, I think of uh, – the man probably directly responsible for putting together an infield that stayed together for like 10 years. And there were some position shifts. Did he talk to you about that? Was that uh, something he was proud of or is proud of? Yeah, I, I, definitely. Russell, really Oaks, the... Scalvey, uh, um, yeah, say. that's the... Billy Russell, the thing that, that, that he liked, I think because, you know, Tommy, people don't realize Tommy came up as a scout. Al Campanis hired Tommy as a scout. So he was scouting a little bit back in uh, in Pennsylvania, but then they brought him out to California. And, in fact, he still lives in the house that he bought as a scout, him and his wife, Joe, out in Fullerton. Whoa. And so, you know, yeah, people think Tommy was sort of, you must have this big mansion. No, Tommy's got the same house that he bought as a scout when he was with the Dodgers. And I think because of that scouting background, he liked young players. He could see the potential of young players. So when he saw those guys as, as young kids, I think he saw that infield for a long time, a lot, a, lot, a lot before some other people could really recognize it. So he knew with these young players, these guys could stick around and be there a while because of that scouting background. You know, he knew the impact they could have. He knew their talent level. And he thought that together those guys could stay there. And I think that's the great thing about Tommy. He'd always say, you know, even when Steve Howe was pitching the World Series at 19, you know, he tells the story all the time that, hey, the umpire doesn't doesn't ask for his ID to make sure he's old enough. I don't care how old he is. Get out there and get him out. And I think Tommy could see their ability. And, and he'd also encourage so he could take a young player, and and even though they lacked experience, he could encourage them to do great things 
because he was always positive and trying to build them up and build up their confidence. And that's why in the book I have, you know, the confidence is probably the most important thing. That's directly related to uh, Tommy. And I tell a story um, in the book about F.P. Santangelo, and we called him up to the big leagues, and F.P. in Montreal. And F.P. was probably the only guy that thought he believed that he could play at the major league level. But that inner confidence struck me as this guy is, you know, he's got that type of confidence of a major league player. And sure enough, he ended up playing seven years in the big leagues. Right. Uh, I think he's from Sacramento, too, if I'm not mistaken. Does he is. He is from Sacramento. He, uh, yeah. Um, and now a taller guy a little bit. brought Washington Nationals. Yeah, isn't that terrible? Um, you know, Sacramento has had was such a hotbed of baseball for so many years. Dusty Baker um, came out of there. Did you get to know Dusty very well? I've met Dusty a couple of times. You know, he played at Del Campo High School, which was close to my school at Highlands. And um, and so I would run into him, and certainly I spent a lot of time, you know, with the Dodgers and, and with the Rockies and the, and the National League West. So we would run into him on, on occasion, and then when he was in Cincinnati as well. So we'd talk a little bit. I never really got to know him well, or did, we didn't work together. Uh, but at the same time, he was always very, very cordial and very nice to me just because of that Sacramento link you're talking about. Larry Boa, Jerry Manuel. Oh. A lot of yeah. Um, uh, were you responsible that, that, for bringing Jerry Weinstein to the Colorado Rockies? I know he was was a minor league manager with them for a while. Yeah, I hired Jerry not only in Los Angeles with the Dodgers first, but then uh, with the Rockies as well. In fact, Jerry's going to manage um, after that great uh, time they had with Team Israel just now in the WBC. Yes. I was hoping to make it um, and keep on advancing. Uh, but I just talked to Jerry the other day. He's going to manage their the Rockies Double A team in Connecticut this year. So he's still oh, going. Oh, he was in the California League for a while, and um, he was. There's a there's a man that this Israeli uh, team could give him, uh, you know, whatever it takes to keep keep going on and. Uh, I think he can manage in the big league someday. Do you, uh, he's not too old. Do you, would you say? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, Jerry uh, with the with the Rockies. Jerry coached with us at the major league level. Um, and oh, I didn't, catching didn't realize that. And yeah. Okay. Yeah, he was uh, he was at the major league level, but you know, I think he decided that he liked being with the younger kids more and wanted to go back down into the minor leagues. And so that's it, why. You sound he, like uh, you're one of those that puts uh, credence in having your best coaches in the, the like Cashman, for instance, in the um, uh, early league, the class class A uh, short league um, teams to welcome kids into big league for the transition from college or, or high school ball. That's a big job. Well, you bet. Um, yeah. Ralph, Ralph, you better have good instructors in the minor leagues, and you better have tasks. You know, I joke about Koch and Jerry. I mean, I got a story. We were in Modesto. Jerry's managing the Modesto team, and Dexter Fowler and Eric Young Jr. come up to me and say, hey, this guy is making us work too hard. We're out here at noon, and we play at 7. We're practicing the whole time. We're tired by the time we get to the game. I mean, this guy's out of control. you got to talk to him. And this is Dexter Fowler and, and Eric Young Jr. Both have had good. Uh, Dexter just they just won a World Series in Chicago with Dexter. Now he's in St. Louis. And I right. look at those two, and I let me tell you something. I played two years for the guy. Why don't you guys just play better, and maybe I'll move you up to Double A, and you can get out of here. Well, Dexter always <laughs> jokes. <laughs> Dexter hit about 380 after that conversation and got to go up to Double A, and he just laughed good. now at that. Uh, yeah, they love Jerry <laughs> now, but at the time, yeah, he he makes you work, and Koch was the same way. Tom Kochman, I mean, you you got to work, and to have those type of guys, and you know, you're only going to have a 
a, a big strong tree if you got good roots, and that's where you grow the roots right there. And absolutely having those that that, that level of instructor and that level of taskmaster, I think at the lower levels when players are young is the only way to have a a really a long impactful career. Bill, would you speak to the relationship between scouting and player development? Um, from my years uh, with Tops, I, uh, I'll give you an example. Grady Fuson was an A's minor league coach, uh, obviously a scout made famous in Moneyball, but he coached that um, A league in the Northwestern League, that um, – short A league and and brought players in. Do you think it's a big advantage to have your scouts um, work in player development as well? And if so, why aren't there more scouts involved in that? Well, I I talk a lot about that in the book, and that's the thing in my book, Do You Want to Work in Baseball? It really – You know, people think it's like a front office book, but there's a lot of scouting and player development in there, and I talk a lot about that relationship. And it's really important for a baseball person, no matter what job you have, to have not only an appreciation but knowledge of what everybody does. But you're not going to be a good minor league manager or big league manager unless you have some type of scouting sense about you. You know, the two managers that I've been around that I thought were the best scouts or tried to be the best scouts were Tommy Lasorda because he was a scout and Felipe Alou. I mean, these guys were really into player evaluation and determining who should be on their team. They wanted to talk to scouts and learn about, you know, what what their opinion was because you really need, uh, in all jobs, you really have to know uh, if you're a scout, how the coaches and managers are going to perceive this guy, what type of things are they going to want to do with them. At the same time, if you're a manager or coach, you've got to understand why the scout liked him and what the scout sees in his potential and why and the type of investment that's gone into this player. I mean, you've got to, you've got to be able to deal in all of it and to try to just say I'm an expert at scouting but not understand – how players are treated, dealt with, and, and given instruction, or what they're going to try to uh, adjustments they're going to try to make with him, it really put you in a in a situation where you, you can't really succeed as well as you could if you understood all that. So that's the thing for me that 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 relationship between scouting and player development not only has to be co- co- cohesive, but it's you've got to it's it's one hand in the other. You've got to know what everybody's doing. And it's got it's it's a relationship of an organization. It's not a relationship of departments that are just you know working in the in the for the same ball club. It's the same organization, and they're really one department as I see it, because you're taking the raw materials of a young kid and try, and then the other group tries to refine it and put it at the big league level. Then you have that other that other group at the major league level that's got to be cohesive. Uh, with those groups as well. So it's it's a tough exercise because you get a lot of people and a lot of players and you're dealing with human beings and egos and whatever else. But to get them on the same organizational plan is what you're trying to do. And I think uh, the, the more you can train a player development, coach, manager, um, you know, instructor, whatever, to be understand um, – scouting at some level. They don't have to be a great scout, but they need to understand the process of how they got that player and why these people appreciate that player. Now, there are two schools of thought on scouting that I want to ask you about. One is the old school of a scout, uh, muscle on the dollar, that, uh, you know, dollar sign on the muscle on the muscle, that sort of thing, the eyeball test and all of that. And then um, what was the um, Billy Ball success and and the um, writing about it from the standpoint of stats and uh, new age stats. Can you speak to that? What, what do you ask? What would you ask a scout today to be concerned with uh, 
um, well, most. I I would say you you better be concerned with all of it, and especially with uh, the statistical and anal- analytics part of the game. You know, that's something that's been suppressed by old school traditionalists for a long time, Ralph. And so what's happened is the once, you know, Billy Bean and, and those guys came out, they kind of opened up the floodgates, and now we can, we're can we watching it go all through Major League Baseball. You've got a lot of young, younger, more academic minds who don't have a lot of experience maybe in scouting or in baseball, period, running these ball clubs because of that. And I think the pendulum right. swung pretty far to the analytical side, and it may come back a, a little bit, but statistical analytics is here to stay. And now it's only another way to me, the way I, the way I perceive it, it's the only, uh, only another way to look at how scouts looked at the game, and they've learned how to, through the numbers, quantify it. And I'll give you an example of this. I went out to watch a kid. They asked me to go out to watch a kid in Dallas, Texas, high school kid, and they wanted me to go scout him. So I leave the front office there in Denver and with our assistant scouting director, and we fly down to Dallas to watch this high school kid. Now, we're off to the side. I watch him take ground balls. It looks like, hey, this kid's going to be okay at shortstop. You know, he's got good actions. He can throw the ball okay, fine. I'm, I'm all, yeah. Looks like he can play. he'll be able to play short at the big league level. We watch him, uh, you know, he's a 17-year-old kid, but you can see his actions out on the field, and he looks fine. I've got no worries about him playing defensively, and when I'm watching a shortstop, that's the first thing I'm going to watch. He gets in the batting cage, and I can tell there's some strength in his swing. You know, he's not a big guy, but there's some strength in his swing, and as I'm watching, you know, the ball leave the bat, this guy's hitting the ball pretty hard. You know, it's coming off his bat good. So I say, okay, fine. Then I'm watching him, and I say, hey, you know, he's going to hit a lot of balls in the air. You know, he's got this lofty kind of swing where just naturally the ball is going to get hit in the air. Now, what I'm looking at is exit velocity because I see the ball coming off the bat very, you know, he's hitting the ball very hard. So I know that if you want to use a modern-day statistical analytical term, it's exit velocity. If you want to right. look at what I'm saying, he's going to hit the ball in the air, that's launch angle. And so I'm just scouting. That's pure scouting what I'm doing. And yet there's a name for it in the statistical analytics. And yet old school traditionalists try to say that once they hear launch angle or exit velocity, they just shut down. They don't want to hear it anymore. Well, that kid was Trevor Story. And he came up last year and hit a bunch of home. But at the same time, that's old school scouting right there, what I was doing. And yet, they've just named it and quantified it. That's all. And why people have this, you know, aversion towards uh, modern day analytical terms, I have no idea. Because to me, it makes you better. If you can quantify what I'm looking at as a scout and help me somehow determine what would be the best, why wouldn't you want to do that? Unless you're just holding on to something that you've done in the past and the romantic idea of a fishing hat and some guy being out there have a gut feel with an eyeball test to being able to hook and play. You're just right. holding on to this romantic idea that, um, you, that you have and some ideological view of it over, you know, modern tech, techniques that make scouts better. So I don't, I don't get the whole thing. I, I really don't. I think, but, you know, at the same time, I can remember back in 1992 where Larry Corrigan, longtime Minnesota Twin Scout, and I are watching a California League game in Visalia, California, and during the pregame, we're figuring because Bill James had just come out with a, a new stat called Runs Created. And we're out there trying to figure out runs created for players at the A ball level in the California League. Now, those are two oh. scouts at the time trying to do that. So I think a lot of it is really uh, it's, it's dramatized too, too much. There's not really that big a difference. There's not much of a resistance then. 
I don't have as much. I think, well, I'll, I'll tell you this. I think when you say resistance, there has been resistance, and there continues to be some resistance. And to me, I don't understand it because scouts have always looked at stats. There's no scout that ever walked out and just tried to use his eyeballs to figure out. He says, okay, where's this kid been? What's he done? Let me look at his stats. I mean, that, that is, okay, that is then let's talk about the radar gun. And I, in, I read something, an article this week, about some kid that wants to pitch at a he, – he claims to be pitching at 107 miles an hour. And he wants to be known as the fastest guy, Dalkowski be damned, you know, I'm going to be the fastest right. guy. And I wrote – I put that essence on, on – on the Comfortably Zone radio page on Facebook, and I put that link on there to the article, and I put, I think this is the essence of what's wrong with the game and what's why injuries come up. People want to throw 100 miles an hour every pitch, and there's more right. paid to that than the radar gun doesn't tell you how straight the ball goes or how much movement it has, conversely, and it doesn't tell you how much difference there is between a kid's fastball and his off-speed pitch. In the old days, that was the biggest thing. It didn't matter if he threw 88, 89. If he could throw 68 as, a, as an off-speed pitch, he's going to fool batters. And isn't that, A, isn't that the idea? And do you agree with me that just trying to throw hard on every pitch could be what's causing all of these uh, Tommy John-type surgeries, um, horrible arm problems, even before they get into pro ball? Even be, you know, and you, you read about kids um, having surgery in high school and what have you. Am I far off on that? Oh, I don't think you're far. I mean, the name of the game at the big league level is to get out. Now, there's a lot of studies that will tell you the harder you throw, uh, the 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 more outs you can get, or the probabilities that you'll get people out have increased. At the same time, you know, trying to max out, like you're saying, and throw as hard as you can all the time, you still have to pitch and get out. Nobody's going to give you at the big league level – you know, anything, whether it's arbitration or somebody's going to give you a contract or a manager and a coaching staff is going to allow you to be on that team is because you're effective getting out, not because you can throw hard. There's plenty of guys that throw mid-90s. Go watch some minor league games. These guys can't get out of the minor leagues and they're throwing 95, 98 miles an hour because they get clobbered every time they go out there. So throwing hard, yeah, it's great. From like a scouting sense, every scout will like him if he can throw 100. But at the same time, at some point in the final analysis, a big league manager's got to say, this guy can pitch. I want him on my team because he can pitch, not because he can throw hard. So right. that's the difference. So, yeah, you're talking in terms of, you know, the, the pitcher's got to get out. Now, if he thinks this velocity, if he's trained, you know, trying to train himself to throw 109, well, I mean, I guess if that somewhere along the lines of getting out and he thinks that's going to help him get out, it's fine. But if his goal is just to throw hard, then he's not hes not really focused on the real goal of getting out at the big league level. that That's the real goal. Okay. Two things. First of all, it comes to mind, you were in Palm Springs. Was Pete Rickard the general manager when you were in Palm Springs? Pete Ricker, I named him in the book as well as another guy I was very close to, Ralph, and we spent oh, a lot of great Friday. guy, one of my favorite guys of all time. Howie and Pete yeah, Ricker was... were up there in my memories of doing tops for for 15 years. They uh, tell me about Pete, your experience with Pete. Well, Pete, just so you know, we were pretty close um, every Friday night at home. When we played a, a Friday game at home, after the game, he would take me out to some piano bar in, in uh, Palm Springs, <laughs> and he'd sit there. And his wife is actually a really good singer. She was a professional singer. So she would sing and, at the piano bar, and we'd have fun sitting there with Pete. And I would ask him questions about pitching and 
he'd still tell me old Oriole stories and, and we just had a great time. But that's, you know, there's another guy there that, uh, in fact, one time I was telling him in one of those Friday night sessions that we would have that, uh, cause he was telling me he could still pitch today. He only, he had to stop because he had like a blood clot issue, um, in his shoulder, but he could, he could still pitch if he had to. And so, you know, me being a young kid playing in the minor leagues, I said, Pete, I would love to hit off you. Da 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 da. And I'm telling him I would just, I would, I, I just hope I didn't hit one back at you and hit you. That's, that's what I would be worried about, this and that. <laughs> so we go out the next day and to go out to stretch, and we're all coming out of the clubhouse, and guess who's standing on the mound getting ready to pitch to me? It's Pete. Wow. And this guy, I'm telling you, I mean, now I'm used to facing, we're playing in California League, and you got guys throwing close to 100 and, you know, 90 to 100 miles an hour every night. I mean, that's all we see. Hey, Pete he is 50. By, by then, Pete is 50 yeah. years old, right? 50 years old. And he gets out yeah. there and he's warming up. And so I see this and I'm taking this challenge. So I get in there and I'm standing close. I'm on the dirt while he's finishing up his warm ups and I'm watching him. And I'm saying, this guy's throwing pretty hard. I mean, he's 50 years old. I'm telling you, he's throwing 90 miles an hour. And I said, holy cow, you know. So I get in there and kind of, I think he, I hit a couple ground balls, a pop-up, whatever, and he storms off the mound like he's, you know, he, he was right. Yeah, like he I owned it. Kind of, yeah, he, huh? he was great. He was another great mentor. I've had a lot of you know, former players or whatever say, hey, Bill, you know, how do you learn some of this stuff and this and that? And then, and there you go. It's spending time with Howie Gersberg. It's spending time with Pete oh. Rickard, playing for Jerry <laughs> Weinstein, Al Ferrer at UC Santa Barbara, Mike Gillespie at, um, you know, playing up in Alaska where we all went. We, nobody went to the Cape back then. You made more money in Alaska. We went to when we were college players and spending time with Mike Gillespie. I mean, these guys – Really put a lot of things. And then in professional baseball, Felipe Alou, Bill Livesey with the Yankees. I mean, in my book, I talk about in terms of scouting how I was taught with the New York Yankees and during the early 90s. And this is before Jeter and Posada and Bernie Williams and Pettit and Rivera. Those guys were all in the minor leagues when I was there. And, in fact, Jeter we just drafted when I was there. And so Bill Lizzie is the guy that trained us all how to scout, and that's the really the beginning of all those great Yankee teams in the late 90s and 2000s was from Bill Lizzie and him teaching us how to scout, and also in terms of player development. So I've had just a tremendous amount of mentors, and that's why I wanted to write the book, is to you know really preserve a lot of the things, that whether it's Tommy Lasorda, Felipe Alou, or Bill Lizzie, or Howie, or Pete, or Tom Kochman, and any of those guys have really put into me about what's important to play in this game. I tried to put in that book to help young people that are all in on the statistical analytical stuff to understand there's a lot more to this game than just what you read in the formula right now. And there's a lot of people in uniform or in scouting that actually have a framework of how they do things they have a process of how they do things. They're just – just nobody's really put a lot of this in a book form before. There's different books on scouting, but a lot of stories about how they scouted a guy. This is a more academic look at the qualitative analysis, not just the quantitative. Gotcha. What is a player's biggest adjustment between amateur ball and pro ball that first year that we talk about, that short A league? The the schedule, Ralph, the schedule. It's a huge adjustment from a physical standpoint. Um, usually in college you play a Tuesday game, you play one midweek game, and then you play Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Friday, doubleheader Saturday. You have a lot of rest in terms of, you have practices where you might have Monday off and all that. In professional baseball, you get, you know, two to three off days a month, you know, maybe four, and that's it. Right. And usually just three. And pitchers now don't throw every Friday night like they do in college. 
or in high school, they have to throw every fifth day. And so the physical adjustment is what you worry about the most, and that's what you really pay attention to. Plus, you know, professional routines, you know, how we take batting practice, how we, how you, you know, get ready to play. is a, it's, it's much more organized, detailed, and strict as far as if you're going to be a, a very good player at the major league level. You know, the tools aren't that much different. Guys throw hard in rookie ball. They run fast. They have good arms in the outfield. The only thing they don't do is they don't bring their talent to the game every day. Like a major league player is consistent. Even though they go through slumps or whatever, they have consistency. So those routines that you build in rookie ball are really, really important to build consistency, to be able to go day in and day out and take care of your body and not only for them, a rookie ball player's got to get stronger and whatever, but um, those routines are really, really important. So the physical nature of switching from amateur to professional is really, really important. And it's the biggest adjustment they'll ever face. Those kids are worn out by the time they get to the end of that half season. They don't know what hit them because uh, the physical nature of professional baseball is just much, much different than amateur baseball, especially high school. Wow. This has been terrific, Bill. Uh, You know, podcast radio is shameless self-promotion. So what I'd like you to do is give the folks out there a good idea of the book, where they can buy it, how they can get it, what your website is, how they can get with you. Um, Let us know, Bill. Okay. it's um, The book is called Do You Want to Work in Baseball? Um, The Where they can find it is on Amazon or on our website. My website is uh, InsideBaseballOperations.com. So it's InsideBaseballOperations.com, every word spelled out and um that's where they can find it and i really i mean i feel like i'm you know i don't i don't feel like i'm promoting myself i'm just trying to promote the book i just feel like there's a lot of information i mean clint hurdle told me the other day that he thought everybody in baseball should be reading this not just people trying to get into baseball and i know that you know the people that have read it they're just baseball fans that wanted to learn more about scouting i mean how does the scout do it It's in there. And that at some level, it's not really about, you know, I don't look at it in terms of sales and numbers and money because I don't make much money. (laughs) I don't think anybody, unless you write these big novels, you're not making any money on books. What I'm hoping is that people really read it so they can appreciate a lot of the lessons and a lot of the information there that's from people of the past that have been in this game that have really, I've been fortunate enough to learn from. And that's all, to try to preserve some of that so that people can read it and, and really understand it and appreciate it. And some, for students or for people, former players that want to get back in and want to scout, well, there's a little bit of a guide in there to teach you how people actually do it. And the, the response has been great from people that read it and, and, you know, the emails I get or the text messages or phone calls. I've been really, really happy with that. The problem is just making people aware. That's all. Okay. And I hope that Do you have another book aware. in the hopper? Do you, did this encourage you, or you, encourage you to write more? Is it cathartic for you? Um, Ralph, anything I, else I, going? I it, was, it was a year and a half process of doing this, and I don't know if I could really do it again. Um, I've been okay. asked if I would write another book. And I told them, I, at this point, I really don't think that I will. Um, I might, but at this point, I, I really don't think that I will. I don't know that I can invest the type of time that, that you need to, to to really write a book that I want to be proud of. And if I'm going to be proud of it, it's going to take me a lot of time and right. you know, a lot of effort to try to do that. It's a, it's, it's a difficult exercise. I mean, I'm a great appreciation for people to do this. I mean, how they crank books out all the time, I have no idea. Oh. For me, you can stare at the same paragraph for two days trying to figure out, you know, what word would be best here or what word. And that's maybe a little bit of my meticulous nature. I 
I, I struggled with that well, at times. How about where to put the comma? Should I put a comma here? Should I, you know, would that help <laughs> punctuation? So much to oh. it. Is there anything that you didn't put in the book that you wish you had? And is there anything you put in there that, you know, you might not have put in there if you had to think well, about it again? Well, no, Ralph, I had started out when I first went to my editor with a 150,000 word book and they told me that that was between you know 600 and 700 pages and they said nobody will invest the time to read that so I got it they told me to get it down to 90,000 words so I cut 60,000 words out of my book and a lot of them were great stories uh, and great lessons I thought from Tommy and, and other people, and and, um, and and some of it was redundant, so don't get me wrong. I mean, I could probably got out of 130,000 words and and told, a, a, you know, had a, a real good book in my mind. But, um, you know, there were some things that I had to cut out that I wish I I didn't cut out. You know, one, Might one that was – fodder it. for another book? I don't – you know, potentially, potentially – I mean, there's a lot of people. Just curious. Think that the, yeah, there's a lot of people that think um, that aren't in the baseball world. They think my book is a business book in disguise. Um, so that that part of it's from their perspective. A lot of the things I talk about in terms of organizational consistency or uh, just the framework of basic constructs, starting with philosophy and all that, they really see a lot of. Uh, similarities and and what they do in the corporate world or or in business. So, um, okay. you know, that's what I. One thought. final Maybe question more... comes to mind, and you've been so generous with your time. I'll ask you this: If I had a seven-year-old kid or a ten-year-old kid with some real talent, would I want that child to play baseball all the time, or would I want him to play? basketball, for instance. I don't think I want him to play football, just for the idea from an injury standpoint. But do you think the um, concentrating on just baseball is good for a kid or um, or not? Well, I wouldn't play another sport just to play another sport. But what I would, what I would do, especially um, uh, making it age-specific, is that I would really monitor how much they played in organized baseball, especially with the pitchers. Um, I think there's a lot of overuse injuries going on right now in youth sports. You know, I asked Walt Weiss one time because his son, Bo, was, you know, at the time travel ball and all that. and He was telling me about all these tournaments. And I asked Walt, I said, hey, Walt, you're growing up there in New Jersey or wherever you grew up. I said, let me ask you a question. How many games did you play in baseball in Little League? And he said, well, about 20. And I said, that's all you played? No winter ball? And then he goes, no, we didn't have weather. We didn't have any winter ball. Or... I said, so you played 20, 20 games a year in Little League, and yet you played in the big leagues. You went to college. You had this great big league career. You played on world championship teams. And yet yeah, nowadays, here. We're, we're telling me these kids are playing 150 games. It, it just doesn't make any sense to me that, you know, and you wonder why all these injuries and all this stuff. Well, just look at the changes around you and look at all the kids that are getting Tommy John before they're a high school senior. And a lot of it is because they're just playing way too much. And so if you had a seven-year-old to answer your question, I would say I don't care. If he just loves baseball and wants to do baseball, that's fine. But just work out in baseball, practice, but just – you know, all these games and pitching and playing, I think it's just way too much, and I think it's unnecessary. Um, I'd rather have a good coach and, you know, you can work out, you can practice, you can go hit in the cage, you can play pickup games like we all did. There's nothing wrong with that. But these organized games where you're pitching, you know, a couple times a week, year-round, I don't I don't know that that's the best thing to be doing. So right. for well, me, I'll yeah, tell you. Let's Renfrey Field in Sacramento for night league ball, speaking of ball, was where it was at in our day. And um, well, 
Ralph, if we didn't play, we were out there watching. I sat on that scoreboard in left field at Renfrey all the time growing up with some peanuts. Oh, I parked my car. I parked my car down the right field line and right right in the back and just sit and watch ball. So many good. Do you remember a kid named Sam Lovelace? At a I, I know that. I know that name. I know that name. You know, I know okay. we mentioned Sacramento names, and we didn't mention the Lees, Lee Ron and, and Leon. No, no, yes, the Lees. Lee Ron. And I we didn't up, mention the Sacramento up, Smokies. Bill um, McNulty and all those guys. I mean, and the list goes on and on of great players. And, yeah, the Smokies, that was what we always watched. Is they played at night, and we'd play right. our games during the and then we conned one of the parents into taking us over there to watch the Smokies, and we chase foul balls. I can't think of his name, but the manager, just uh, manager and owner of the Smokies, passed away um, a few years ago. Um, great old guy. Uh, and then there was American Legion ball. I don't know if you knew Manuel Perry at post sixty one. Is that yeah? Manuel I had a lot Hill? of play for sixty one. Yeah, um, uh, Joel Bishop was a, a number one draft choice with the Boston Red Sox, came out of post-61. Uh, Roland Office came out of post-61. Um, yeah. I think Sacramento you know, Ball. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you, just remembering Tommy Kochman, the days of Tommy Kochman, and the late, great – Howie Gershberg um, was a, a nice cheer me up for me today, Bill. This has been terrific. Please come back. Um, love to have you as a guest again. Everybody out there, buy the book. He don't make much money from the book, but you know, you buy it. It'd be good anyway. How's that? Yeah, you help and support a baseball author. That's always good. Do you want to work in baseball? <laughs> Oh man! Thanks. Um, I can't wait to I can't wait to read it, and uh, I look forward to you coming back. Thank you for a great morning. Appreciate this, sir. All right, All right. everybody out there, keep on keeping on. We'll be back another time down the road real soon. Adios.